All right, it's noon. Welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining our second installation of the ATL AIGA in-house series. Um, I'm Sam Zellifro and I'm here with Lucas Alvarez and together we're your host for this session today. And um, we're both on the in-house committee of the Atlanta chapter. And I currently work at Kimberly Clark as a global brand design manager in our B2B sector, managing a few of the visual identities for the brands in our portfolio. Lucas, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm a brand, I'm a design manager at The Partnership. It's a Atlanta advertising agency and we, we build brands as well and build campaigns for a variety of different companies throughout Atlanta and the country. And so as a quick overview, we just wanted to start with reminding folks, you know, what this program is all about. You know, we heard from in-house designers across the city that you know, they're looking for inspiration and connection. And since we're, most of us are in-house designers, we feel the same way. You know, some of us work on large teams, but many of us are either the key design person in our organization or work on smaller teams. So we're looking for an opportunity to build up, to build community and to learn from one another. So that's really what birthed this program in the first place. So the plan is every month that we'll feature a different member of the in-house community to share their experiences. And with that, I want to pause for a moment because there's been so much going on, you know, across our community and really the country from the pandemic to the civil rights issues. So we wanted to take a moment just to thank everyone for joining and for building community right here with us. So we have a great hour together today and we're in the midst of our introductions, which you can see in the overview. Um, in a moment, I'll turn it over to Amy Mangan and um, She's our partner from the creative group. She's going to share the market minute, and then we'll dig into the conversation with Ed Roberts, our special guest today. And we'll make sure to save some time at the end for Q and A. So if you've got questions, put them in the chat. Lucas is going to be our tech support today, so he'll keep an eye on that um, and kind of proctor the Q and A at the end. Sound good? Uh, one last thing, I'd like to just uh, introduce our committee here. So this is our entire committee. We all worked hard on this and I wanted to give them a shout out as well. So just sharing that. Yeah, thanks guys. And I think the good thing, you know, today Lucas and I are hosting, but in the future, the plan is to rotate. So you'll get to hear from these folks in future months if you're able to join. Yeah. All right, let's turn it over to Amy. You're up. Market Minute. Hey guys, I'm Amy Mangan. I'm with TCG, the creative group, um, and really excited to be here and share some info with you about the Atlanta market. So, Lucas. Yeah, check out. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll talk a little bit about Atlanta and then kind of what's going on on a national level as well, and then fi finalize with some tips for you um, of what to do right now. So in Atlanta, um, we actually have access to an analytics tool uh, that gives us a behind the scenes look with career builder of kind of what's going on. So I took a snapshot of the last three months actually, which has basically been the whole time that we've been locked down. Um, and for graphic designers specifically, there were less than 200 new resumes posted in the last three months. Conversely, though, there were 800 new jobs that were posted in that time. So the good news for you guys is that you're in the right industry and you are still in demand. So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The jobs are not as easy to come by as they once were. That is certainly true. But um, those numbers definitely show that you should still um, fight for, you know, increases and things when you're looking for a new job. Um, and then also some good just kind of local market news. So Facebook recently announced that they're planning three new remote hubs. Um, one of those is going to be in Atlanta. So we're not exactly sure when, but we're thinking sometime next year they might start that process. The other two are in Dallas and Denver. Um, and then also Microsoft announced that they're going to be adding over 1,500 new jobs in the digital and creative space. Um, and they're planning to put that office in West Midtown in 2021. So that's exciting. Um, on a national level, 32% of the organizations that we surveyed, not just the ones that we work with, obviously, but the ones that we surveyed, said that they, can, they are planning to continue using uh, contingent workers in order to 
continue cutting costs, but also risk. So they're leveraging that freelance and contract space quite a bit right now. So they don't have to worry about layoffs or um, any uncertainty in the future. And then also 74% of the CFOs who we surveyed said that they do plan to increase remote work post pandemic, which is great news for those of us who live in Atlanta and deal with this commute. So that's good. Um, lastly, this is a national trend, but I actually think we're seeing the same thing here in Atlanta. So it makes perfect sense. Um, these are the hot skill sets according to what clients are coming to TCG to fill at this time. So everything from e-commerce, e-learning, um, and digital events has been quite hot for us. Digital events like this event would have been in person before, and now here we are. <laughs> Somebody's producing this stuff on the back end. Um, customer experience uh, for UX and UI design, and then also uh, we've seen a heavy influx of communication strategy and content strategy roles as well, which makes a lot of sense. And then moving on, um, the next part is just a little bit of a reminder of what you can do for yourself um, and your team to, um, you know, to remind everyone how to best take care of your um, background in the market. So make sure that you're diligent in updating your portfolio, your resume, and your LinkedIn profile at all times. I cannot stress that enough, especially designers. You guys have to be current with your portfolio. Don't wait till your job, you know, suddenly changes and you're having to scramble to find samples from months and months ago and you're digging through things. Like when you have a good piece that you're excited about and you like it, pop it in there and keep it updated real time. Same thing with your resume and your LinkedIn profile. And those should sort of run concurrently, of course. Um, and with your LinkedIn profile, make sure you're actually adding your, your portfolio link in there now too, um, because that is a good place to look for jobs. Um, so um, stay active on social media. And I would say LinkedIn, obviously that goes without saying creating and sharing relevant content. But also now that we're so digital, look for groups on places like, you know, Facebook, whatever, um, that have groups that are relevant to your industry and stay, um, stay connected there because we're seeing great groups spin up specifically in Atlanta that are helping people get jobs, stay connected, sharing information. It's really exciting um, for how that is working. And then also once you've done those things, you can continue to tap into that uh, build your brand and tap into that network when you need to, whether it's for yourself, if you're looking for a job or for people that you know, to, in order to try to help them. So um, the one thing I can say is that in-house has remained relatively strong through the last three months, um, despite everything going on in the market. So um, we're seeing a lot of exciting things coming out of in-house teams, which is why we're really excited to partner with AIGA on the in-house insider series. So with that, I will send it back to Sam. Yeah, thanks. That was awesome. All right. So, I All right. Oh, there we go. I think that was a yes slide build. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Oh, there we go. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. All right. Now for the the um, the main event. So we've got Ed Roberts with us this month. He is a brand and creative director at Georgia Power and manages a team of about 30 plus professionals responsible for the omni-channel development and implementation of the organization's brand and creative strategy. He's also a writer and speaker with more than 25 years of agency and client side experience. So we have a ton to learn from him today. Um, his passion around elevating teams and accomplishing top tier work is really inspiring. So let's jump in. All right. Ed, welcome. Hey Sam, how are you? Good, good. So, so excited to be here. So excited to have you. I can't wait to eventually meet in person. Um, but this has been great being able to connect with you via Zoom. And I get to know you over the last couple of weeks. Yes, absolutely. Same here. Um, real excited to be in the Atlanta area. Um, uh, came from North Carolina. Very strong AIGA uh, chapter here. Um, so super excited to um, be sitting down with uh, both you and Lucas today and Amy um, and ready to kind of mix it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So to, to kick it off, tell us a little bit about your, um, your career journey. And I'm, I'm interested too, just pivotal moments in your personal and professional life that brought you to Georgia Power and got you to Atlanta. Yeah, so it's, it, it's been a, a long journey. Um, I knew at the age of eight 
that um, I, I remember sitting at home, we were snowed in for about five days. And um, I was absolutely, I think, day two, bored out of my mind. Um, and my mother just handed me, just to kind of keep me from bouncing off the wall, she handed me like some paper and some crayons and markers. And she said, just sit over in the corner and draw, just do something, but just get out of my hair. And um, it was at that moment that I discovered that I um, might have a talent. Um, basically, I drew our family portrait and uh, showed it to my mom and my dad and, and she was stunned. And so um, I loved that gratification that I got when I drew. And so uh, I knew at that point that I wanted to do something um, where I could use my creativity. And so throughout my life, very young life, even into my teen years, I, I went to a, a high school called Inlo, uh, GT Magnet School here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and I focused on um, design. Um, I took a two hour studio, um, I think it was two days a week during that time. Um, and there was a session, we learned all things about art and design, but there was a, a semester where we learned specifically about graphic design. And that was, I think it was in the 11th grade where I, I heard the term for the first time, logo. And I remember my uh, art teacher, her name was uh, Mrs. Malik, um, and she was a former graphic designer. And I was fascinated um, with all things dealing with design. And um, it wasn't until that point, until I had that, that little bit of training as a kid um, that I was like, that is exactly what I want to do. And so I uh, went to college, went to North Carolina State University, uh, got into the School of Design there. Um, tough, tough, tough school. Um, and, and the word in North Carolina is that it's so difficult to get into that college. How did you get in? And I would tell people, um, actually, it was harder to stay in. <laughs> I think they were trying to lead you out like, <laughs> every year, but um, I made it through, um, learned how to critique work, um, pretty much had a pretty strong foundation in Swiss design, mm -hmm. um, learned a lot about the Dadaists, um, learned about, a lot about Russian constructivism, so I had a very good sort of foundation in design and also graphic design history, um, took typography one, two, two three, and four, um, and failed miserably in my first type one class. <laughs> <laughs> but got it together and um, um, just really began to love design. Um, and the last semester that I was at the School of Design, I decided to uh, do a, a custom studio that I created for myself and it was in editorial publication design. Mm. Um, and the magazine that I, that I developed was called Meridian. And I had some big philosophical thing about what that meant and all of that stuff and um, did a lot of really cool stuff there, but uh, wanted to focus my uh, career on uh, publication design or editorial design. And uh, subsequently, right before I graduated, I got a job at American Scientist Magazine. Um, and my first title, professional title was Art Associate. And I don't even know what that means. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. That was my next question. So what does that mean? I, I, I don't know, but I changed it years <laughs> later. I changed it to assistant art director. So that, you know, <laughs> you a go. lesson, yeah, sure that makes more sense. Yeah. But um, when I was there, um, I was there for six years. And, and during that time, I felt like in order to really be a great publication designer that, you know, I had to be in that, that space for at least 10 years, you know, um, when you think of New York and, and back then, you know, magazines were huge. And we know what, what's happened now with magazines. It's all digital. Right. Um, but, but then it was like, you know, everybody that I researched was in that business for a long time. So I was there for about six years. And when I was there, um, I got to do a lot of amazing things. I learned a lot about research while working at the, that science magazine. I was working on... Um, um, articles um, and visualizing a lot of the data. Um, back then we just called it statistical charts. Now we design or infographics. And I did thousands of those things when I was there. Um, so, so 
anyway, that just gives you a little bit of an idea of kind of my start, um, where yeah. I came from. Very helpful. So, so what brought you down to Georgia Power? Yeah, so, um, you know, I've been working in the industry for several years. Um, mm -hmm. I was working in an organization, uh, I was a federal government contractor, set up a, a new team there. I had worked in the utility industry for about nine years here in North Carolina, and I missed um, the work. Um, I, I missed sort of the services that were provided, and I missed being able to um, develop campaigns that really educated people, customers. Um, and so one day I was in traffic, and uh, I looked up creative director, utility, and, and it just so happened that that day, Georgia Power had posted my job. I applied the next day, and about eight weeks later, I was down in Atlanta. Wow. Totally not planned. Crazy. <laughs> I'm always interested in hearing how people kind of end up where they are, and sometimes, like, it's amazing when that happens. Like, it just, lucky chance, you saw it, and, and it all worked out, and we're so happy to have you as a part of the Atlanta community now. Thank you so much. I started in September, and I'm real happy to be at uh, Georgia Power. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to say one quick thing too about that. Uh, it, it just show, goes to show to always be looking, no matter what time, whenever, if you're thinking, check it out. And be prepared. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like Preparation so goes, meeting opportunity. Yeah. So that goes back to everything Amy was just saying, to always have your, your portfolio and your resume ready to go. So spot <laughs> on. Well, tell us a little bit about a day in the life in Georgia Power. Like I know, I know you started in the fall and all this pandemic stuff has happened and I'm sure nobody's living a normal day right now, but right. what does a day in the life look like for you? Well, as everyone knows, probably Georgia Power is a very large organization. We have about 8,000 employees. Uh, it's a legacy brand throughout the state of Georgia. Um, we serve 155 counties out of the 159. Um, so that's a lot of customers. Um, Georgia Power, um, as you guys know, um, they, they're building Bogle, which is a new nuclear plant, the first one built um, in 30 years in the United States. Um, we're talking a lot about clean energy, and uh, nuclear actually is very clean. Um, we're in solar. Um, Georgia Power also has a very strong economic development arm, so those teams actually bring jobs to these communities and businesses. Um, they're creating jobs throughout the state. Um, so there's never a dull moment at Georgia Power and my team um, both internally and externally are really servicing every department within the organization. Um, so we're working with our energy efficiency team to educate our customers on energy efficiency and how they can actually um, save energy. And what I love about the utility business is it's one of the few industries where you produce a commodity that you actually market and tell people not to use as much of the thing that you're producing. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. So that presents a really interesting challenge. Um, so there's never a dull moment there. Um, I have a very uh, talented team of individuals. I have a brand strategy team that reports to me. Um, they are managed by um, my brand strategy manager. Her name is Crystal Anthony. Very proud of her. Um, and then I have a brand creative team uh, who is managed by An Andrew Huff. Um, and within, under him, there is my video team, uh, there is the photo team, there is the web team and the graphic design team. Um, and then I have a new um, um, sort of division and we're calling it our digital strategy division and that's social media and also our website. Um, and that is managed by Crystal Musseden. And how is your leadership role positioned in the organization? That's a really great question. So um, Brand Creative is actually positioned within corporate communications. Okay. I report directly to the vice president of corporate communications. Um, and uh, there are two directors, myself uh, on the Brand Creative side, and then Charlie Sutliff, who uh, manages um, all of our media relations. Um, internal and external communications. Um, okay. so, so that's the reporting structure. Interesting, very cool. Yeah, I've, I've only worked for very large organizations and um, throughout my you know, 10 year career, I always see design, like the reporting lines kind of swing on this pendulum. So I'm always interested in like, where does it sit and what does that mean for 
you know, how design is used in the organization. Yeah. Um, yeah. So very cool. Um, can you talk a little bit about, so you talked about your internal team, but you've also talked a lot about your external teams that you work with. Can you discuss yes. a little bit about how you guys are um, situated? Right. So okay. coming into um, Georgia Power, uh, we work with an agency um, and, it, and they're called BML YNR. Um, they uh, do a lot of our creative work. Um, they also uh, work with us on strategy development for some of our integrated campaigns. Um, they do, they help us do a lot of the mass communications and marketing. Um, and then we also work with our sports marketing agency and they're called Octagon. Uh, both are based in uh, the heart of Atlanta. Um, incredibly talented team of folks there. Um, and what they help us do is manage our um, sports marketing partnerships. So Georgia Tech, the Bulldogs, uh, Atlanta United, uh, the Falcons, anything that you see uh, in the stadiums, uh, Fox Sports, uh, we, we do a lot of marketing to our customers in those venues. Um, it's really important to all of us in corporate communications and, and on my brand strategy team and my design team to make sure that we are delivering the messages that our customers need where they are. And so it's really important for us to uh, have Octagon and BML help us do that. Cool. Yeah. I had a quick question uh, talking about working with agencies and, uh, you know, you have this mass amount uh, of mediums that you have to apply. So what's one of the ways that you balance keeping it all consistent, but getting some fresh brand look and feel from the agency side, you know, we're always trying to push it. And I know in the in-house that uh, you might want to try to keep things consistent, but you, you definitely want to make that tier one creative. So how, how do you do that? Well, I think you have to really start with a very solid foundation um, in a, a, a really good brand um, set of values, standards, and guidelines. Um, and many of you know that probably three, three and a half years ago, Georgia Power, um, we are a, uh, a part of the Southern Company, which is also based in downtown Atlanta. Uh, they developed a new brand style guide system um, for all of their operating companies. And Georgia Power adopted that system. Um, it is a really good system. The logo was um, refreshed, as you guys know. Some people like the old logo, some people like the new logo, you know, it just depends on which side you're on. Um, but I, I think it's a really strong brand. And as I was um, doing my research about Georgia Power before I applied for the job, um, I, I first had to look at the style guide and make sure it was something that I could work with and also um, determine if it was flexible enough to go just to the edge without going over. Yeah. And so what I try to do is encourage um, not only the outside agencies, I mean, most agencies are, are wanting to push the envelope anyway, so that's good. Yeah. But um, it's also trying to work with that internal team and get them to understand that, you know, everything, although we have templates, there are ways for us to um, create and expand the brand within the guidelines without going over. Um, so we're always looking for ways to do that. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely understand that push and pull building brands of being able to like say, look, this is a standard, but we still want to expand it. And it's cool to hear from you that this, this uh, brand guideline has a lot of that flexibility. Absolutely. And I hope you guys are seeing that we did um, a new Think Alignment campaign that uh, came out about a month ago uh, for Alignment Appreciation Month. Um, and we did a lot with uh, paid social um, we did a lot on our website organically. We did a lot on our social media channels, but we also did some new things. Um, some of you may or may not have seen them, but um, we did a lot of um, out of home digital advertising uh, for those folks that, that were out on the roads that they could really get those messages. And I remember driving um, on 75, you know, thinking, wow, was that really the right decision for us to do during all of this pandemic? And then I realized, I've been in Atlanta traffic, and it, you, you got to really pay attention with all those cars. But when there was less vehicles, I thought, ah, I can actually get that message. Yeah. So <laughs> I felt like it was a good thing. <laughs> That's funny. Well, can we expand a little bit on um, how you work with external agencies? I know a lot of us 
you know, we're in-house, but we work with agencies for certain things. So you've talked a little bit about some of the agencies of record. Do you guys ever bring in other agencies for specific tasks? Do you work with freelancers lancers at all? Like, how does that work? So I'm a real firm believer that, um, you know, when you have a really solid set um, guidelines, brand guidelines for your organization, um, it takes a lot to get your team to get your, your agencies of record up to speed on, on that look and feel. Yeah. Um, and when you specifically start thinking about tone of voice, um, when you start thinking about brand strategy, there's so many components to the standards that make up for, it, for this case, the Georgia Power brand. Um, I think it's really important that you focus your partnerships. Mm -hmm. And when you focus those partnerships, you create a rapport and a language so that you don't have to kind of re-educate people every time you come up with a new campaign or some new initiative needs to be um, developed and then marketed. Um, so for me, it's really important that um, right now, what I'm looking at is how can I get my selected agencies of record, Octagon and BML Y&R, to work collaboratively with my internal team. Mm -hmm. So when I came to Georgia Power before, when I was working in the utility business, um, my internal team probably did 80% of the tier one brand level work. Um, and then the rest of that work, the overflow went out to agencies. So from, from my experience, it really flipped, I think, from what most people are experiencing in house. Oftentimes you see a lot of internal teams working on that tier two, tier three work. Mm -hmm. And depending upon the structure of, the, of, of how you tier your products, maybe even tier four. So as I came into Georgia Power, I saw an opportunity to really um, leverage that internal team. And so right now, what I'm literally going through right now is working with my external agencies of record and working with the various processes with my internal teams and figuring out how we can collaborate together and do more of that tier one work and bring more of that work internally. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I think that's really, um, it's just interesting to hear some of the tactics and stuff. I know when we met before, um, like as we were getting to know each other, you talked a little bit about some of the, the ways that you um, build the team, whether it's internal people or external people. Um, you talked a lot about building ownership across lines. Can you elaborate on that for folks on the call today? Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest thing that, that I would say is um, in order to build a really solid relationship, both internally with your internal team and with your external teams, because first of all, they, that both have to understand that they're all on one team. Yeah. Um, you know, there is one brand that you are really um, advocating for marketing um, and positioning well in the market. And so there can't be five different pages. There can't be the external page and then the internal page. It's got to be one page. Mm -hmm. And that page has got to be for that brand. And so it's really important that everyone that is creating work for that brand, whether it's strategy, whether it's implementing new pages on the website, whether it's developing a social media strategy and implementing that, creating posters, you all have to be speaking the same language. And you all have to realize not only is there one page, but it's one team. So it's getting them to um, think more holistically and not separately. But the other thing too is just, I think part of my job is to help them get educated Right now, I mean, just to be really practical, I am compiling and working with Southern Company on um, getting some student of the business um, videos together so that I can share that with my agency of records so they can learn more about our business so mm -hmm. that when they're in meetings with my internal team, I mean, I will be sharing this with the internal team. In fact, if they're new employees, many of them have probably started these student of the business, that's what we call them, uh, videos. And so I want my internal agency, external agencies to learn the business as well. So that when we're in meetings and we're meeting with our internal partners, when there's terminology used that they may not be familiar with prior to this education, they will now know. And so I think education is key. And also this idea of being on the same page and collaborating as one team is really important. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like an orientation, right? Getting everybody kind of on the same 
playing field so we can play the game together. I think that yeah. makes a ton of sense. And it's interesting because I started my career on the consumer side where, you know, everybody brushes their teeth, everybody washes their hair. So those experiences we can all relate to very quickly. Yes. Um, but when I transitioned to a B2B role, I mean, it, it took me probably a year and a half to really start to understand, like, what do those transactions look like and how can I design in support of that? So I love this exactly. idea. It's, I'm sure it's very similar in utilities where like we all kind, I mean, we all use power, right? But <laughs> does that really mean? And what do those interactions look like? And so to bring everyone up to speed quickly with, you know, a form of orient or orientation, yeah. like education, I think is key. So you kind of yeah. take that under your wing, like as a design leader to say, okay, I'm going to educate folks. It's important, yes. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, I know you guys are sharing my portfolio, um, and, and I just want to say um, that there, there, there was a village that put that portfolio together. I have had uh, and have been blessed to have some incredibly talented agencies and designers that work for me, um, and they're all, they were all in. So that work that you're seeing there was a culmination of passion and education um, and, and, and Sam, that is so important. It really is. And I think that um, it goes back to when I worked at American Scientist Magazine and I talked a little bit about research. When you understand fully what it is that you're trying to do, that's a very freeing thing creatively mm -hmm. because you know the parameters that you're able to create in and you can explore and do some things that um, maybe no one else in the industry is doing. And I think um, what you know, folks might see today is that, you know, in some of that work, all of that work was done for a utility, an electric utility, yeah. in an industry where really the customer doesn't really care about you until that light doesn't come on. Right. <laughs> right. Almost expected, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I, also, I, just to chime in on the collaboration coming from the agency side and working with other teams uh, from their in-house teams, uh, I can't stress enough the importance of that collaboration too. To say it's it's so difficult to just be handed a, a book, a guideline, and say just follow this and here's the assignment and it's a piece of paper. But it, it makes yeah. the world a difference when you're actually getting to talk with the people and, like you said, Ed. Uh, really describing the mission and describing what you're trying to do there, uh, being part of, making it part of the team, even though they're external, awakens creativity. It makes it uh, a lot more freeing and it makes it a lot more collaborative. And I really appreciate that. Absolutely. I love what you said there. Um, you know, many of you may or may not know, but Preston Alkwright, who was one of our um, founders and, and early presidents, he coined the term a citizen wherever you serve. And in Georgia Power, that is a value that resonates not only with the current employees, but all of the volunteers that are retired employees of Georgia Power that are working across the state of Georgia um, to help build community. Yeah. And so I think, you know, as we sit down as a team, I know that pretty much everyone on, on our team in corporate communications understands what press and off right said and what we try to do every single day with the work that we produce for our customers is we want to deliver that message and we want that message to permeate through everything that we're doing that we are here as a brand that's that's here to serve the community and i think that that is something service um is such an incredible value um in what we do and i know that a lot of designers and a lot of internal teams really don't like that word Mm -hmm. um, of service, but but I would I would advocate for us to really rethink that term and understand that what we do um, is incredibly important, um, and it's very tangible. Those things that we're doing because what we do is educate, and that is a real service, and that's what we do as designers. We we basically take a blank page, whatever that that screen or whatever it is, and we create something that educates people that hopefully will change behavior and it's really important and i think i think that really aligns with those values that president off um kind of had for the company um many many years ago that's awesome very cool 
Um, I want to transition a little bit to talking more explicitly about how you've elevated internal work throughout your career. Because again, that's one of the things as we you know, talk to other in-house teams across the city, folks are looking to do. I mean, you've touched on it a little bit, but um, can you share some of the experiences that you've had and how you've done that with the teams you've led? Oh my gosh, that's a great, that is a really great question. And I'm sure you're doing the same thing, Sam, at your place. Um, but, I, you know, for me, I, I have always, I, first of all, I think strategy um, and research is incredibly important um, when you're wanting to do work that's transformative and work that will change behavior. Um, I, I will, in the industry, I will sometimes look to the left and the right, but oftentimes I'm looking ahead. Um, I had a really um, rigorous and, and fruitful conversation with one of my brand strategists yesterday, and I said, you know what, I'm not someone that wants to attach my wagon to the hot topic of the day or the moment. I really want to look beyond that and figure out how we can position ourselves better and appropriately for our customers, for mm -hmm. our stakeholders. Yeah. And um, I think in order to do um, work that is transformative, you really have to, again, go back to educating yourself. And I think it's really this sort of when you're looking for talent to bring on your team. Um, you know, it's interesting. I had a designer one time uh, who said, I, I don't want to do a bill insert. I don't want to do another bill insert. It's just so boring. It's nothing to it. And I said, you know, it's all about how you think about it. It's not a bill insert. It's a mini poster, <laughs> right? It's a mini poster. And, and when we had that conversation, we then, we were trying to compare, um, analog meters, not to get too, too technical, but analog meters and digital meters, right? It was during that time where um, in the industry, uh, utilities were uh, changing out those analog meters and, and installing uh, meters that had uh, AMI technology. Uh, so they were a little bit more um, accurate. And so many of you probably have those if you have a home or if you look at your apartments, maybe you'll see the, the, the digital meters. Um, so he was saying, well, how would we go about comparing this? And that was when I went back to my design school days and I said, well, let's look at Russian constructivism and let's figure out how we can do that contrast and comparison. Let's make it propaganda. Um, <laughs> we want to educate people about, we want to educate people about why we're changing these over, but let's have a lot of fun with it. And so he looked at it um, as a poster and actually uh, those series of bill inserts that we created won a lot of awards within the industry. And um, people started to know this little team that was doing all this, this great work. It was a team of four. And I remember one year, I don't know if you guys have the, uh, I'm sure you guys have the Addy Awards um, yeah. yep. uh, in your area. And you guys are familiar with Print Magazine and um, uh, How Magazine. Uh, How Magazine is no longer um, being produced. Um, but slowly that little team was, you know, we, we changed our mindset. We didn't think of things as being just the same old mundane thing. We really mined for the gems within the mundane and, and really tried to make something extraordinary out of it. And I remember one year uh, we went to the Addy Awards and we were up against a lot of big agencies and we won the most Addies that night with some, some of the biggest agencies. And it wasn't for one piece or two pieces, it was for a myriad of pieces. So I felt really good. And I remember telling my designers uh, at the end of that, I said, it's because of you. It's because you changed your mind and you also took the time to do the research. And that's why you were able to do work that is award winning. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Cause I feel like it can be so easy to fall into kind of the grind every day, you know, but stopping to change your perspective, to do some research, you know, I, I find a lot of inspiration from history, whether it's, you know, the archives for the brands I lead or whatever, right. um, to kind of change the perspective and to reinvent, you know, the status quo. So it's, I love the example. You shared that when we talked before the webinar and mm -hmm. I, I thought it was so interesting because yeah, those to me are some of the most fun design challenges, right? When you look at something that feels kind of basic and like, God, I've done a million of these before. But if I just change my perspective a little bit, I can kind of reinvent the approach. Yep. Change your perspective. And, and, and you know, just quickly, I remember another time um, we were designing a logo and, and it was a different designer. 
And um, it, it's kind of a funny story. I hope you guys don't mind me telling this, but uh, he was a, um, a, a, a how, how tall was he? He was six eight. Oh, this really, this really tall guy. Um, he went to Bowling Green. Incredible designer, killer designer, uh, and he just happened to be Caucasian. And I assigned him a logo, and it was for a Swahili festival, music festival. And he said, you know, Ed, I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't think I can be authentic designing this. And I said, why? And he said, well, I'm a white guy. What am I doing designing <laughs> you know, yeah. a logo uh, for a Swahili festival? And I said, but the, the point of it is that you've got to again change your mindset. Um, and I gave him artists to look at, Romare Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, um, and gave him the space to actually learn a little bit about Matisse and some of these other artists. Um, and I said, just because you're Caucasian does not mean as a designer that you can't design for anyone. Right. And so, you know, I told him, I said, listen, I was an uh, African-American student at design school and I was studying Swiss design <laughs> um, and I did it well. And so it's, it's just about kind of taking those fears off and just really diving into something, but, but, but let that research be your safety net and that thing that you can hold on to. And then if you've got that, you can do anything. Yeah, that's yeah, really, really inspiring. Yeah. I did one more thing on that too, is like, uh, just credit to your leadership of, of allowing people, like inspiring people to get out of their comfort zone and to think past what something is on a piece of paper as described, like we're just doing a flyer. No, it's a poster. Like being able to pull people into different perspectives is a, an awesome tool. And that's really cool to hear from you. Cool. And I just, I feel like it's a great way to build empathy as well. Giving people the opportunity to educate themselves, to, to dig a little bit deeper. I mean, again, I feel like I can relate to that, you know, des designing and beauty. Like I love beauty care products, but moving to B2B sector, you know, products that people use, you know, aerospace engineers, like that is so far over my head. <laughs> so far <laughs> over. Being able to dig down, ask questions, do the research, I think is such a great way to build empathy and to to, to do something really powerful. Absolutely. Um, I really love that you use that word empathy, um, Sam. I, I am a firm believer that empathy trumps or transcends sympathy. Um, yes. If you guys take a look at my um, um, portfolio, uh, there's a piece on there called the Scratch Made Daily. Um, and it was a calendar that we created for our economic development team. Uh, and this was at another utility. And um, it was really important to me that, you know, I have a very small team work on that project. I had a designer, a photographer, and my printer. And, uh, and I literally had them, every location that you saw, that was completely done in-house, that project. Um, and I remember one time we were in Washington, North Carolina, and we were featuring Bill's Hot Dogs, this little bitty tiny place. Um, and they fried hot dogs, right? And they had white bean chili, and I remember that. And we went in and my writer was like, you know, I, I'm not feeling, I'm like, what are we gonna do here? And I said, okay, well, I talked to the owner. I said, I want my team to have the experience of working here for half a day. And so we all put on the hair nets, Yes. We sat there and we served customers for about four hours. Wow. And then after that, we actually started to do the interviewing. My photographer started doing the photographs. And so everything that we did, and what I try to do with my, my teams uh, when I was spoken speaking more as a creative director, is to really have that empathy and understanding of what it's like for that person to do that specific job. This was economic development, so it was all about creating jobs and business. And so when we wrote the story, it was from a more authentic voice. Yeah. When we photographed, it was from a more authentic vision, and everything came together. It really is how you change your mindset. Oh, Ed, this is awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> so great. What a, what a cool experience. And um, again, like I just admire your leadership and kind of setting up that experience for your team, because I think that makes a huge difference for everyone involved. So very cool. Um, 
I see we've got about 15 minutes left and we wanted to leave 10 for Q&A. So the, one of the last things I wanted to touch on, um, we had originally met, you talked a little bit about your writing experience, which I felt like was really unique. I mean, I don't know a ton of designers that also are writers. So can you talk <laughs> a little bit about that? Like how you became a writer and how you use it, you know, yeah. in your day to day. Sure. I mean, it, 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 I never wanted to be a writer. Um, I went for my first How Design Live conference in 2011. Um, and I was, you know, just like a fish out of water. We were in Chicago. It was my first time in Chicago. And I met Andy Epstein, um, who is the author of The Corporate Creative. And I met him, and he was running uh, the in-house management track at How Design Live. And uh, at the time, I was very familiar with the magazine. Uh, I remember it even in, in college. Mm -hmm. um, and I would look at it, um, but I wasn't very familiar with um, blogs at the time. And I remember paying $50 to have uh, lunch with a speaker, and it was him. And I remember uh, we were all sharing advice. And later, I got him to sign my book, and he said, you know, you had some pretty good insights. He said, have you ever looked at the How Design, Live, uh, How Design blog? And I said, no, I've, I've never looked at it. He said, well, I'd love for you to look at it and make some comments if you feel like it. Well, I made a couple of comments. And about a month later, I got a personal email from him. He said, hey, uh, I really like your comments. Um, have you ever thought about writing? And I said, no, I've never thought about it. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I'd love to give you a column. He said, we're not going to pay you, but love to give you a column. And I was like, I asked my wife, and, and I said, I don't know about this blog thing. I had never even heard of blog. I mean, I literally just a fish out of water. And um, um, I started writing um, for my uh, column called In-House Observation. That's where in-house ops comes from. And I remember sitting on my bed. My dog was with me. And I just write about my daily experiences. And then I remember one time I was at an industry conference, a utility conference. And one day my phone started blowing up. and it was, comments from my article and so that's where it started i started with a free column with um how and then that led to me writing um several articles for how magazine um i have interviewed michael beirut um i have worked with alex center um so the writing actually um led to me actually um in 2015 uh, and uh, uh, Andy Epstein actually recommended me to take his position um, in planning in-house management track for How Design Live. Wow. And then from there, just everything opened up. I started writing for the Creative Group blog um, and just writing about in-house, uh, in-house creatives. And I just discovered um, at the age of, I don't know, what was I, 43? Um, that I had a, a, a different skill and, and a voice that I, I'd never discovered before. And so um, I have done a lot of things in my career that when I worked at the city of Wilson on Nash Street, <laughs> you know, for city government, never thought that I would do. So I would encourage folks to keep pressing um, and, and, and really um, never giving up on a dream and, and, and definitely be open to new facets of your career being cut. Very cool. I feel like you've had several examples today of just kismet, things just kind of happening and snowballing into bigger things. Like how cool to hear about your journey and all of the awesome stuff that you've done. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, should we transition to a little Q&A? I see a yeah, couple sure. of questions that have come up on the chat. Um, I see a question, Ed, do you have challenges around the ROI and effectiveness um, and effectiveness questions for your industry and company? How do you know you've succeeded? How do you measure? That's a really great question. So um, as I said earlier, I have a brand strategy team um, and work closely with BML YNR. Um, how do we measure? Um, you know, obviously on social media, you've got, you know, in tools. Um, we work in Sprinkler, so we're able to look at how often we're mentioned. Um, we're actually currently developing a corporate communications dashboard where we're, you know, sort of pooling all of that data from our website, where people are going, how long are they staying on the site? 
Um, what are they saying um, about the, the creative that we're putting out there? We also do a lot of surveys. Um, so we have a customer experience team um, within Georgia Power that um, goes out and does these online panels. There's probably 4,000 electric utility customers, residential customers, that are willing to take those panels and we ask them questions about the things that we do. There's also probably um, maybe a, a couple of hundred uh, commercial customers that we can uh, survey. But we also do some things called um, a ComEdge uh, study where we can look at how our uh, campaigns are performing in the market. And I'm talking about our mass market campaigns. Um, we look at brand linkage or you know, if we pull the logo off, are people able to understand that um, those assets and that messaging came from Georgia Power. Um, so there's a lot of ways.